Thank you, Brenda. Um, and uh, just a quick sound check. Can everyone hear me okay in the back? Are we good here? Um, so now we'll shift into a little bit of a different segment of the symposium today. Um, <clears throat> and I really have the honor to kind of tag team this presentation with Dr. Rivera as well. And so I'll be initially covering some more of this broader scope of rabies and history of rabies in the United States. Um, and then we'll have the ability to hear a more focused presentation from Brenda about Puerto Rico specifically. So when we look at rabies historically in the Western Hemisphere and in the, in the Americas, we know from folk uh, tales from uh, native, uh, uh, Alaskan natives in the north and from early reports of conquistadors during colonization that certainly rabies was present in the Americas before colonization occurred, at least as far as arctic foxes and vampire bats. But it wasn't really until after colonization that we began to have consistent uh, reports of rabies transmission and, and wildlife such as the fox, um, and really moving into the 18th century when we begin to have confirmed uh, outbreaks of rabies in dogs, and most likely brought over uh, during the process of colonization as dogs were brought into the United States. And so this is largely the picture uh, of rabies in the United States uh, moving into the 19th century when we have really the first uh, paradigm shift in rabies with Pasteur's development of a vaccine that for the first time gave us a method of intervening uh, for a person who is exposed to rabies. But throughout the 19th century is largely where we have the classical cultural image of rabies, to kill a mockingbird, uh, old yeller, the rabid dog is roaming down the street as people flee from it and run to their homes to avoid an exposure. And so this is largely an urban crisis with a very high mortality rate and quite a considerable amount of public anxiety and fear caused by the circulation of rabies in dogs. And so even after the development of Pasteur's vaccine in the late 19th century, it wasn't really until another 60 years later that we had the development of more potent vaccines and really the first considerations that we could actually actively intervene in the transmission of rabies virus in the reservoir of dog to prevent the transmission and humans from acquiring rabies. And so coming out of the Second World War, the United States began to actively uh, look at rabies control um, and beginning in 1938, declared both animal and human rabies a nationally notifiable disease, uh, enhancing surveillance across the United States. And then in the 1940s, the first mass uh, campaigns were implemented to mass vaccinate dogs in a community with a very immediate and dramatic effect notice with not only a reduction of rabies in dogs, but similarly a reduction of human cases of rabies. Um, and this ultimately progressed on with uh, campaigns throughout the entire United States and largely resulted in the control and elimination of canine rabies virus variants and dog-to-dog -dog transmission of rabies um, by the late 1970s. But as we continued the surveillance, what we saw is that the face of rabies began to change in the United States. And so as canine rabies was controlled, the reservoir, recognized reservoirs of reported animals shifted away from domestic animals to the wildlife species that were now maintaining rabies virus in nature. And so when we look at rabies in the United States today, we know that human rabies is relatively uncommon with one to eight human cases reported in a year. But rabies is not a rare event in the United States. We still have between 25 to 35,000 human exposures that receive prophylaxis each year. And on average, report around 7,000 rabid animals are reported to uh, the CDC each year. So we continue to move about in a veritable sea of rabies and circulation amongst wildlife. <clears throat> uh, there was ongoing uh, reintroduction of canine rabies virus variant led to additional control efforts, uh, but again, these variants have been uh, eliminated, and primarily now the reservoirs consist of wildlife carnivores, of raccoons, skunks, foxes, um, and mongoose here in Puerto Rico, and also circulation of several rabies virus variants and, and many species of bats, and largely because of the broad distribution and movement of bats, every area in the United States is considered enzootic for rabies, uh, with the notable exception of Hawaii. And so not only have we seen the changing face of rabies away from domestic animals to wildlife, but we also continue to see shifts in the relative uh, numbers of reported wildlife. 
Um, with historically in the 60s and moving all the way into the 80s, uh, skunks really being recognized as one of the primary and most frequently reported rabid animals. But largely because of a uh, translocation event of a rabid raccoon out of the southeastern United States uh, into the northeast that resulted in a very uh, quick and rapid progression of this variant throughout the entire eastern United Seaboard, we saw a shift away from skunks and now the most frequently reported rabid animal in the United States are raccoons uh, with broadly distributed throughout the eastern United States. And raccoons really continue to remain uh, the most frequently reported rabbit animal and are responsible for most of, of the cases with considerable spillover into other species like skunks, foxes, uh, and domestic animals. And so raccoon rabies routinely each year um, as a variant accounts for around 70% of all the uh, cases of animal rabies that are reported in the United States. Uh, looking a little, that's a little bit more specific numbers for 2010, which is the most recent year that we have finalized data, um, there were a little over 6,100 cases of animal rabies reported, and this did rec represent uh, a significant decline from the previous year. Um, it's also important to point out that we saw a considerable decline in the number of submitted animals during this time period as well. But routinely, because of the broad decentralized network of laboratories in the United States, we still test more than 100,000 animals each year for rabies uh, that are involved in human exposures. Uh, we did have two cases of human rabies reported, Wisconsin and uh, Louisiana, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, we get we continue to see the majority of cases with more than 90% of reported rabbit animals reported in wildlife, uh, and a smaller percentage of domestic animals, uh, with the distribution as I've spoken about. We, <coughs> with the majority of these being in, in wildlife, we do continue to see spillover of these variants into domestic animals, with cats now really being recognized as the most frequently reported rabid domestic animal in the United States, um, and then a relatively small number of cases reported in dogs, uh, cattle, horses, and goats. And while we continue to have very enhanced uh, surveillance and a very good grasp of the uh, transmission and distribution of different rabies virus variants uh, in the United States, we continue to face challenges with the recognition that these are not as once thought static compartmentalized areas where we will have focused transmission of a variant amongst a known reservoir animal, but we continue to see host adaptation and shift most uh, recently in uh, Flagstaff where we saw a rabies virus variant associated with big brown bats uh, spill over with transmission and maintenance of that variant in skunks and uh, boxes in Flagstaff, Arizona. And so, and also from a phylogenetic and, and analysis standpoint, we know that many of the reservoirs that we have in the United States are uh, due to adaptation from uh, canine rabies virus variants uh, that are now independently circulating in wildlife, and similarly several variants that, are, that have parent uh, adaptation from bat rabies virus variants. And so even if we continue to develop oral rabies vaccination to control these wildlife variants, this is a challenge that we'll continue to face uh, into the future. And so quickly now moving away from surveillance and uh, uh, reported rabies and animals, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what we know about post-exposure prophylaxis in the United States. And this is something that we unfortunately do not have as much information on as we do submissions of animals for rabies diagnosis, largely because post-exposure prophylaxis and human exposure to rabies is not a nationally notifiable condition in the United States. And so most of what we know about uh, the epidemiology of, of PEP is based on relatively small cross-sectional studies. And part of this, in 2008, because of a severe uh, supply limitation in the United States, we wanted to look at some of the general policies and practices that states uh, carry out in regard to prophylaxis. And so, on a very generalized scale, what we found uh, is that, by and large, most jurisdictions, uh, prophylaxis is not reportable within the jurisdiction, um, and that prophylaxis has largely shifted away from being administered through the public sector and county health departments, now being largely provided entirely through private, uh, private hospitals and private clinics. Um, and so this creates a complication in our ability to really monitor uh, the administration of, of uh, prophylaxis. The other uh, disadvantage of this is that, uh, as noted by about uh, three quarter, uh, 75% of the respondents to our survey, 
is that because it's administered to the private sector, there tends to be very little consultation between uh, physicians engaged in a uh, consultation of a person's exposure with uh, the expert, experts at a state and local health department um, who have the day-to-day -day, uh, experience in conducting very detailed exposure assessments. Excuse me. Um, and because of this, by and large, most people feel that post-exposure prophylaxis is largely over-administered in the United States. Um, so while we don't have a uh, national surveillance system, we were able from, from the small amount of information that was available for states to estimate the number that we now look at at about 30 to 38,000 courses of PUP and being administered each year in the United States. And this really accounts for a very extensive uh, health, amount of health expenditure in the U.S. each year uh, from the cost of these biologics. Uh, one of the things that we've recently looked at is since the majority of people will initiate uh, post-exposure prophylaxis after potential exposure uh, in the United States, increasingly are, are presenting to an emergency room for their first visit and assessment. Um, and so we are able to look at um, some of the chief complaint and final diagnosis electronic records that are coming out of hospitals um, to try and get a better grip on the national uh, presentation of people for potential rabies exposure or prophylaxis. Um, and this is kind of a busy slide, but gives you some of the aspects that this certainly isn't a surveillance system that we've designed from the ground up. We're really just trying to tease out information uh, from a system that's largely just designed to track what uh, patient visits are coming into the hospital. Uh, but to give a little bit of a broader picture and idea, um, this is essentially includes information from 541 facilities. Um, and what we see is that there's usually a relatively even uh, split of male and female uh, patients presenting. When we look at this as, as a more detailed cross-sectional studies, we tend to see a slightly uh, larger bias towards male presenting for potential exposure. Um, but with a relatively young uh, mean and median age and higher uh, presentation rates amongst uh, children. Similarly, when we look at it from a time perspective, we also tend to see more exposures and prophylaxis occurring uh, during the summer months, July to, uh, July to August time periods. Um, and this is largely consistent with what we know from, <coughs> sorry, this is largely consistent from what we know about the uh, circulation of virus in animal populations, and also we see this very closely with submissions of animals for diagnosis uh, during this time period as well, uh, particularly amongst people with potential exposure to bats. So that's really the conclusion of my talk. I will turn it over to Dr. Rivera uh, to give her presentation before we have uh, some additional questions. <laughs>